we will get rolling. Thanks everybody for joining us here today. I'm really thrilled to have a, um, a time to discuss the budget and everything else happening in Ottawa and the pan Canadian scene around health about a week after the budget. We like doing it a couple days later, so we have a chance to digest it and think it through it a little bit and hopefully give you some more thoughtful insights than you would get based on our initial gut reaction the day of. Uh, so we'll flip to the next slide and and just to flag a couple things that uh, for those that don't know, uh, I think most of the, the folks on here are friends of Santa. So you know who we are. We're health and life sciences consultants that focuses on management consulting, government relations, as well as communications. And I'm joined today by a couple of my colleagues, uh, which we profile on the next slide, but you can also see our beautiful little videos here on screen. Um, Danielle and Eden, uh, for those who on the call have worked with Eden, you know what I speak when she's a rock solid, outstanding GR practitioner. And Danielle Fleeler, who joins us, she's also in our Ottawa office, comes to us with a strong health research background. And if I have an instinct, she's gonna be excited to speak about that with you uh, today. A uh, couple housekeeping pieces. Um, you can submit questions, please do. Um, I'll try and keep track of them and we can see them as we go. Some we might answer live, some we might uh, answer in writing. We also have the benefit of uh, many of our Santa's team on the line here as well too. So if we can't answer it, hopefully somebody from our team who's watching will be able to answer it as well too. Um, the slides will be shared afterwards as we always do. And we'll also be sharing a recording of this. And we, we also produce a survey at the end because we wanna make sure that we get feedback from you in terms of what different things we could do on these webinars and make sure that we're constantly improving them to meet your uh, evolving expectations of what you need. With that, I think I'm turning it over to Eden to give us a level set on where we are today. And then we'll start talking about the budget and a couple other policy files from there. So over to you, Eden. Thanks, Peter. Um, next slide, please. So just to start off, it's important to recognize the impact that the supply and confidence agreement has had on the federal policy agenda over the past year. So beginning in March 2022, the agreement provides the Liberals with support from the NDP on confidence motions in exchange for action on joint priorities. That includes the Canada Dental Care Program that will start to see rolling out in May for those eligible. However, the uptake from dentists is considerably slower than hoped with National Dental Association citing lack of details as the main issue, and we really have yet to see action on this program. Over to Pharmacare, we'll talk a little bit more depth about this later, but it was tabled in March. Um, so the Liberals continue to move forward with their promise to pass the legislation, although it's not likely we'll see this until the fall winter session. As for health outcomes across the country, the federal government has made uh, a numerous amount of deals with provinces uh, looking at those bilateral deals, which we'll get into a little bit more later. And as for the Safe Long-Term Care Act, after the public consultation we saw end in September 2023, we still have yet to see this act tabled in the House, but it's likely to come before the break in June. So the question still remains as to if the NDP liberal deal will last until June 2025. But as both parties gear up for the upcoming election, we may see them wanting to differentiate themselves more, which could result in an end to the supply and confidence agreement. Um, next slide, please. So looking at kind of the different parties that we have, we have the Liberals remaining in power with the minority government. And with the tabling of budget 2024, we really see the Liberals use this as a turning point and reset for the party as they try to respond to the needs of Canadians, with a particular focus catering to the worries of millennials and Gen Z through this budget. Now, the Prime Minister has assured the public that he will remain leader of the Liberal Party and will run in the 2025 election. However, we are seeing a lot more public speculation over who will be the next leader of the Liberal Party, including rumours that Minister Dominic LeBlanc has been having conversations about what a leadership campaign would look like. Over to the Conservatives. Under the leadership of Pierre Polyev, the Conservatives are particularly focused on the issue of carbon tax. 
aligning themselves with the opinions of the majority of Canadians, as well as Canada's premiers who are calling on the governing Liberals to axe the tax. As for social programs like Pharmacare, the Conservatives are really questioning the effectiveness of these plans. And the same can be said in general for the Supply and Confidence Agreement. We really haven't seen any tangible outcomes from these agreements, which gives the Conservatives an opportunity to take a stance on whether or not the policy is effective without criticizing the actual intent of the policies. And the Conservatives continue to lead in the polls, considerably out fundraising all other parties with a record breaking 35 million raised in 2023. Moving over to the NDP, they've been straddling public opinion on carbon tax and recently in the House, they actually um, spawned, they supported a motion with the Conservatives um, demanding the Prime Minister to sit down with Premiers to discuss the policy and also supporting Premiers' decision to propose alternate plans. So while making major policy gains with the Supply and Confidence Agreement, it may become more challenging for the NDP to position themselves as they struggle to translate their efforts into public support. And as I said earlier, they really may need to kind of differentiate themselves further from the Liberals before the, before the election. Um, and it is also important to mention that nearly a quarter of the NDP caucus have announced that they will not be running in 2025. This could be due to the new federal boundary changes, but if we want to speculate a little, we could say there is a bit of a crisis emerging in the NDP party as we see some of these stalwart MPs like Charlie Angus leaving. It's probably hard for the more um, accomplished NDP MPs to watch the NDP transition over more towards the Liberals. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so looking at the polling, when you see these numbers, it's hard not to believe that the Conservatives would win the next election. But there is a bit of a concern that the Conservatives may be peaking too early, um, and we may see Canadians take to the programs that the Liberals are offering to gain a few points in the polls. We can see clearly that the Liberals have found their base staying consistent at that 25% mark, and the NDP are staying steady at 20%, which the Liberals really need to have any chance of winning at all. But it's pretty clear that uh, it's looking like a conservative win. But this is just a point in time and really doesn't account for the things that haven't happened yet. We still have yet to see how the outcomes of the election in the states, if they will affect Canadians' vote. And it's also important to point out that there have been many instances when the Conservatives have won the popular vote while losing the general election. This can often be attributed to the rural Conservative ridings are often won by large margins. Meanwhile, urban ridings are more evenly split with Liberals winning on the margin. So after 10 years of this Liberal government, they're hoping to kind of clutch on to that minority, but Canadians are eager for change. And with the way things are going, we are likely to see a change in government with the 2025 election. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now taking a step back and kind of looking at what's going on across Canada, all provinces and territories have already tabled their budgets for this year with significant investments into the healthcare system across the country. Over the next year, we'll see provincial elections in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick. And looking over to Manitoba, we have a new NDP government led by Wab Kanu, who is focused on rebuilding the province's healthcare system, doing so by making big investments to address the staffing shortage and putting patients at, sorry, putting patients' experience at the center of care. There are also significant changes being made in Alberta and Quebec in their health care systems. Alberta is restructuring their health ministry and dividing it into four different organizations that would then be interconnected by this integration council that would report to their minister of health. 
And meanwhile, Quebec is creating Santé Quebec, a central agency that oversees the day-to-day -day administration of the healthcare system. So with both of these really differing approaches, and as many of you know, we often see the cyclical change happening in healthcare systems where provinces will try and restructure their healthcare system to address prominent issues, but we still have yet to see if either of these health reforms will actually improve access to and quality of care that Canadians need. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Danielle. Thank you, Eden. Um, so the main focus and narrative of this budget, I think, was not really a surprise um, as news of several of their planned expenditures were announced in advance of the budget release. But this budget was focused on affordability, as that is the main concern for Canadians right now. And as Eden mentioned, particularly the younger generation. So this budget is aimed at reducing anxieties of Canadians, whether they have achieved this, I think is hard to say at this point, but they are trying to recapture votes that the Conservatives may be taking, especially in the 18 to 35 year range, by promising them things like homes and additional support. Now, innovation is another area of focus for this budget, with some substantial investments in AI and research in a variety of sectors. And to pay for this expensive budget, they have raised the taxes on corporations and the wealthiest Canadians, which I think, as you've seen in the news in the past few weeks, is not landing well with the business sector. But keep in mind that this is not the Liberals' audience. So they're targeting the younger generation who does not have the benefits of the previous generation from a financial perspective. And the Conservatives are also positioning themselves as a populist government who is supporting this younger generation and this middle class group. They won't even take lobby um, meetings with business associations, and they're very proud of this fact. And this budget is now aiming at the same group of people, so not corporations. So it's forcing other political parties and, um, and people generally to pick their priorities, but especially the conservatives, it's forcing them a little bit to show their cards a little bit more. And one big takeaway you'll hear from us throughout this presentation is that in many instances, the government has back-ended the funding into years post-election. So you have to be really careful when looking at big promises made, where and when those dollars are actually being allocated. So given that we are Santa's Health and you're here for the Health and Life Sciences, uh, let's get into that. So next slide, please. So we knew that this would not be a health budget given all of the funding from last year. So the budget narrative on health care is largely focused on highlighting previously announced federal care investments like dental care and the federal provincial territorial collaboration on the bilateral health agreements. And also a note is that items from the supply and confidence agreement that Eden mentioned like dental care and the safe long-term care act were included in the budget, but they were really just nods to this agreement to help get the budget passed, but they had no actual new funding attached to them. So there were a number of new investments in health throughout the budget that were specific to health, like some of the ones that we have listed here, and where health was included in the investment, but not sector specific, like with the funding to Triumph and Canary. So some programs aim to help the shortage in health human resources, like the expansion of the student loan forgiveness program, which um, expanded the list to include new health providers like physiotherapists, pharmacists, social workers, who are working in rural and remote areas and the foreign credential recognition program. There were also programs for mental health support, like the 500 million over five years for the Youth Mental Health Fund and 7.5 million for the Kids Help Phone. Now, something that's interesting is the federal government actually just canceled the Wellness Together program very recently uh, and is moving a lot of mental health services back into the provinces. So what this is telling us is that the government is looking at those COVID funding programs closely and is cutting the ones that they are no longer deem their responsibility or perhaps are no longer uh, necessary anymore, or they feel are no longer necessary. And then I think one that everyone in health was looking for was the funding for uh, earmarked for PharmaCare, which came in at 1.5 billion for the first phase. 
And then the two biggest areas for investment for health were in research and artificial intelligence. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper into those two areas next. So next slide. So for artificial intelligence, uh, these investments are a keystone of the government's innovation agenda, including for healthcare. So the vast majority of the funding is focused on creating domestic capacity and capability in computational power and AI infrastructure. So they want to boost AI startups to bring new technologies to market and accelerate AI adoption in critical sectors like healthcare. And there is funding to help support small and medium-sized businesses and innovators to build and deploy new AI solutions. They also want to advance Canada's leadership role with the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, where they are aiming to secure Canada's leadership on the global stage when it comes to advancing the responsible development, governance, and use of AI technologies internationally. So it's interesting to see this approach because Canada used to be a leader in AI, especially from the health, the research perspective, but because of the decline in investments over the years, not just from this government, but from previous ones as well, in Canada, we're no longer a leader in this uh, area. So this is perhaps a new um, area where we are looking to recapture some of that leadership in AI that we used to have. And they will begin consulting with industry uh, soon on a new AI compute access fund and an accompanying strategy to expand the sector in Canada. Now, similar to big ticket items, the spending for this is back-ended with 68% of the fund projected to be spent in years four and five. So that would be 2027 and 2029. So between two more budgets and an election. So now let's get into the health research. And Peter was right in his instinct that this is um, probably the most interesting part for me. So $1.8 billion over five years and significant structural reform in the way the federal government oversees research funding are the top highlights for health research. So I'm going to get into the structural pieces first, and then we'll take a look at the finances. But the government proposed some changes to how current research funding councils will operate. So they will now be reporting to a new capstone research funding organization. The information about this organization is pretty ambiguous, but what we do know is that the tri-councils will continue to exist under this new organization. And the goal is for better coordination and effectiveness of these councils. What we don't know is who is leading the organization and who the organization will report to. The recommendation for the creation of this organization actually comes from an advisory group under ISED. And in the budget, it includes a commitment to legislation around this new structuring, which means that this will likely be a change in authority. Keeping in mind that currently two of the three funding councils, so NSERC and SHRC, report to ISED, and CIHR reports to Health Canada. So putting this all together, does this mean that CIHR will be moving to ISED? And if so, how would this affect investments? Unfortunately, we will have to wait until the fall economic statement, I think, to get the answers to these questions. So for now, we can simply speculate. Um, but the government is also moving forward with the ISED-driven advisory panel on the federal research support system. So the council will be made up of leaders from the academic, industry, and not-for-profit sectors and be responsible for a national science and innovation strategy to help guide and priority setting and increase the impact of these federal investments. So getting into the finances, there is some good news for young researchers with new investments in the annual value of master's and doctoral students, which has been stagnant for decades and has been a really big piece uh, for advocates, so that's a pretty good win there. And then 30 million over three years to support indigenous participation in research. Now, while new investment in health research is positive, the commitment in today's budget wouldn't see 71% of the funding distributed until again, 2027, 2029. So between two more budgets and an election. We also need to consider that simultaneously they are clawing back 100 million of committed but unspent money for the Canada Foundation for Innovation, CFI, which funds health research infrastructure, as well as the loss of a million dollars in its basic contribution agreement. So technically for 2024, this research investment is actually less than in 2018, which is the last time that we saw a large investment in health research. 
So although it's a positive sign that the government is starting to prioritize health research in Canada, and this is a new uh, infusion of money, which is good news, it still falls short of what Canada needs. So next slide. Um, now there's also a range in significance in terms of legislative items to watch. So we have highlighted some here, but to find a full list in the budget, you can look in Annex 3. So I've already mentioned the student loan forgiveness legislation, but there are more that are essentially housekeeping measures like addressing how French and English wording for drugs are used and streamlining tobacco and vaping information sharing to improve enforcement uh, across the country. But more significantly, there is an amendment to the Food and Drugs Act, which would improve transparency when the minister chooses to exempt health products, such as infant formulas, from certain Canadian requirements to increase supply in the event of a, sh a shortage. And then also there is an amendment to the Food and Drugs Act to provide the Minister of Health with the authority to rely on information or decisions of select foreign regulatory authorities. So take, for example, the FDA and in specific instances, which would potentially speed up some regulatory approvals. So now I will hand it over to Peter to go in some other to go into some other priority areas. Um, thanks, Eden and Daniel. That was outstanding. Um, I, I feel like I have the easy part now. Uh, that that sounded like it was the hard part to report all that out. Uh, so let's talk about bilateral healthcare deals. Let's talk about pharmacare, um, and how all of all these things uh, fit together, and then and then perhaps a couple of key takeaways. Um, Helpful slide just to remind you, the federal government since 2015 has fundamentally restructured how it's funding healthcare in provinces and territories. Prior to 2015, you'll recall the um, uh, the deal to fix healthcare for a generation, which was the 6% escalator clause uh, in Canada Health Transfers that was announced by the Paul Martin government back in the 2000s. Then you saw in the Harper government, they constrained those to 3% or GDP, whichever was greater. Um, and then in 2015, those initial bilateral health uh, accords that were signed with provinces and territories, I think they probably around, signed around 2016-17, on both home and community care, mental health and addictions, really provided a foundation for a new type of agreement on health with provinces. And we'll talk about the differences between the two, but it's a, it's a really important change that was leveraged during COVID, and it's continuing to be leveraged now with two new uh, bilateral health agreements working together, aging with dignity, and it's also the same foundation that you'll see pharmacare or drugs for diseases uh, follow as well too. So flipping to the next slide, uh, let's talk about the difference between the two because they're they're important to keep in mind that there's a lot that um, both get out of it. I actually think the federal government gets a little bit more out of these than uh, than provinces, uh, though the most recent deal that included an increase to the Canada Health Transfer was probably put it put it over the edge for the provinces. But the reality is the federal perspective is they don't. They don't have to uh, do everything for everyone. They get to do everything for one individual province. It doesn't actually have to be the same thing. It allows them to get an accountability in a way that you don't often see. That's even though the provinces can decide what they want to put into their accountability measures, the fact that it still is there is a milestone moment. And by way of provinces can do anything they want, the government of Quebec just copied and pasted what was publicly available and then even said to the federal government, they don't have permission to use Quebec's publicly available uh, data without first permission from the Quebec government. So there's there's marginal success across the board for it, but the fact that the feds are getting that sort of data is uh, is a milestone moment for them. It allows them to target funding to make sure that they're driving the outcomes that they, they hopefully will drive based on the priorities they've established. Um, and it avoids, and this is the biggest one, making long-term funding commitments that are based into the fiscal plan. Those year-over-year -year increases to the Canada Health Transfer at 6% were a lot of funding, and the federal government is not spending nearly as much as they otherwise would have. Um, the reality with these bilateral uh, funding deals from the, from the provincial perspective, they're, they're often spending money on something from the federal government that they already were going to do anyway. Uh, the federal government's bilateral health accords, their agreements, they usually drive towards things that are already happening so that they can set that agreement. There's a little bit of benefit around the side, that public reporting and that long-term financial planning that they're able to protect on their end. Provinces are able to generally tailor it to what they're doing, which is helpful. Um, and it also allows them to approach um, different initiatives um, and, and leverage the fact that the federal government is, in, in, is doing it across the board. Um, in a way that they might otherwise not have wanted to do if it was just them going out on a ledge. 
though I, I really do think that it, it comes down to the fact that the province is able to do that one-off negotiation to just do what they were already planning on doing. We'll go to the next slide. Um, the, the deals that we're seeing today, so there's a couple things just to remember, because there's a lot, and that slide that you'll circle back to if when we send the slides out, that's a nice one that lays out all the different agreements, because there's a couple things happening simultaneously right now, and, and it does get um, a little confusing. One, you have the working together bilateral health agreements. So that's the funding for family health services, health workforce and backlogs, mental health and substance use, and modern health systems. It also renews the remaining funding from those 2016, 17, 10 year mental health um, uh, accords. So that was the, the 11 billion that was signed in 2016 had to be reapproved. So the final years of that will flow as part of this agreement. Um, all provinces have signed that working together uh, deal. On the aging and uh, dignity bilateral agreements, that's not as much funding, but it's the ones focused on home and community care, long-term care, uh, support as well as um, worker support in 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 um, that sector as well too. Those renew the home and community care portion of the 2016-17 funding deals as well too. Not all provinces have signed this one, though I suspect they will continue to do it because I think we have a majority of uh, provinces that have signed on to that one at this point. Next slide, please. Uh, and this just goes over everything I just said. I don't think I'm going to go into much more detail, but this will be in the slides if you want to refer to it. It's nice to have that broken down, who signed it, who's not. The only two things that I would say here is that there are other bilateral health deals that would follow the same path. One is for drugs for rare diseases, which was a funding commitment that I think was first announced in 2019, not to kick in until 2021. It's still there. It's $1.5 billion over three years. My understanding is that 500 million a year is built into the long-term fiscal plans for the government. Um, and then you also have what would be the National Pharmacare bilateral deals as well too. So that's 1.5 billion over five years, which would be ramped up uh, uh, over time to, to meet that maximum financial threshold for the feds that they've committed in their long-term planning. You would imagine these two would follow the exact same process because that's what the legislation called for for Pharmacare and that's how they've approached the discussion on drugs for rare diseases as well too. So next slide, please. So let's talk about Pharmacare for a second. Um, the act was introduced in March. Um, it's a really, uh, it, it, it's an act that's, that's structured to guide the efforts of Pharmacare. It's not really a prescriptive piece of legislation that is wildly directive. Um, it focuses on two different um, uh, disease states, not disease states, because because that's not how you appropriately define contraceptives and diabetes. But those are the two indications that they're focusing on, and 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 it points to different things that the Canada Drug Agency can do. But the legislation itself doesn't create the Canada Drug Agency. It does refer to different things that the minister could seek ad advice on, um, including the development of a bulk purchasing strategy, including the development of a national formulary. It's, it's interesting when you read the specific wording of the legislation, and I think there'll have to either be some interpretation of the legislation coming out of it, what's the spirit versus the word. I'm gonna take a more prescriptive approach to my interpreta interpretation of the legislation. Um, right now, if you read the legislation, it says the minister may establish bilateral health deals um, that's focused on single payer or um, dollar first. That writing gives me the belief that there's flexibility that the provinces can do whatever they want and the prime minister's comments coming out of some discussions with the premier of Alberta leads me to believe that that wording is is done specifically to give maximum flexibility over what the dollars are applied for in provinces when it comes to pharmacare. Similarly, if, if you take that same prescriptive review of the legislation and you look at the um, lines around bulk purchasing national formulary, does the minister must request a bulk purchasing strategy or the minister must request an, a national formulary a plan from a Canada drug agency? It doesn't say that it has to be completed. It doesn't say it has to be completed by a certain date. It's just saying that the minister must make the request. I'm sure it'll get done, but it's not a very prescriptive piece of legislation. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, with all of those comments that I just said, a couple takeaways on the legislation. Um, it's incremental. It's not transformative. It's moving the needle slowly, but that's largely how the the, the drug system in Canada uh, moves. Um, so it's not a surprise. Um, it's enabling. 
uh, a lot of enabling language in there. Anytime you see maze, anytime you see requests, uh, it's, it's loose language that gives the minister maximum flexibility. Um, it's risk-free uh, because it requires provinces and territories to sign on. And in fact, it, it wholly respects the jurisdiction of provincial and territories, uh, provinces and territories as well too. And I think includes broad flexibility on the terms of conditions on those uh, bilateral health deals. Uh, we say the impact on the private market is unclear because the legislation doesn't speak to the private market, but it, it's unclear in the sense that if this is taken up and it focuses on these two indications and it um, uh, changes the market, it's unclear how it could impact the private market. It's also unclear if we take the, the legislation and scaled up to other indications over time, how that might uh, impact it. So I frame it like that purposely because we just don't know because the legislation doesn't contemplate anything to do with the private market, but that doesn't mean that it can't be impacted at one point in time. Um, the legislation does refer to rare drugs quite a, uh, at one point, saying that that's where the funding starts with. It's a little bit more clear now that we have the budget committing to some Pharmacare dollars. Um, so it's clear that there's dollars now for rare as well as Pharmacare um, that, that are to the tune of $3 billion. Um, and then I think it will create pressure on the government um, to fund drugs for other diseases when they're picking two. Um, uh, that that is something that the government will have to see uh, to deal with over time. I also think there's a bit of a challenge for this government based on the list of drugs that they've selected um, in the background. Or it's not a legislation. Uh, I think provinces and territories still have full uh, authority over what drugs they'll actually cover under this. But the feds did produce a list, and if if I were putting on a public policy lens, and and I were were thinking about the federal government, I probably would have thought through some sort of guidance document to how they produce this list. Otherwise, it raises a lot of questions in terms of what drugs did you choose and why, even though it's clear that they chose the contraceptive list because that's what uh, British Columbia is doing. And then the, the, the list on diabetes, they were, they were generally favoring uh, generics uh, where generic existed for, for, for a particular um, state. And then the last thing I'd say on this is that the government did commit funding for um, diabetes medical uh, devices and supplies. Um, and they said that they announced that program after discussions with provinces and territories. So I'm not surprised to see it not in the budget, but it might come as a surprise to some who would have liked to see something behind that. So the reality is the staying power on this is questionable if the federal government doesn't have any deals. And I think when Eden started talking about the federal conservatives' criticisms of the supply deal, it's, it's a challenge for the government because in some ways they're right. Um, the dental care program is, is receiving some criticism. Um, the Pharmacare um, program is, isn't quite real yet. So it allows the conservatives to criticize the effectiveness, not the principle behind what they're doing. And that's probably a gift for the conservatives right now to not be caught in a bit of a wedge issue. So move to the next slide, please. Um, timeline, just to keep in mind, you know, these are guesses because we don't know how fast this bill will move through the House. I'm operating on the presumption that the NDP and maybe the government probably want to get this out of the House by June and then into the Senate into the fall to have it passed by the end of the year. That could shift. Uh, I'm not seeing a ton of energy in debate time. I think we've just had second reading lead off. Um, if, if this does pass the House by June, you can expect it to be at committee late May, um, early June. And that's when you'll be doing your submissions and uh, potentially appearing as a witness. And then that whole process would um, uh, be repeated in the Senate in the fall. I, if this took a little bit longer, I don't think the government would be upset. Um, and then I also think that leaves agreements with provinces and territories happening after 2020 or in 2025 after 2024 so there's a bit of a long runway here but um if the ndp put the gears to the governing liberals i suspect they could speed up some of these time frames next slide uh there is the canada drug agency that's, that is in development in in tandem with all of this the legislation refers to the canada drug agency um, there was funding already announced by health canada uh, just before the holidays uh to go to cata uh, to support the creation of the Canada Drug Agency. They did focus on three different things that this agency would do, appropriate prescribing, uh, data collection, expanding access to uh, drug and treatment data, and then reducing drug system duplication and lack of coordination. I'd suspect we'd hear more about the progress on this over time. Uh, I, would, I would imagine there's a significant amount of governance work that needs to take place for this to come to reality. And then at one point after that governance work is in place, you'd, you'd see what the agency would actually focus on. And it's important to note that a lot of what's in the legislation for Pharmacare in terms of what, minute, what advice the minister can ask the agency of or CADETH of, it's things that CADETH already does. So I don't think there's any net new authorities in the legislation as it relates to Pharmacare and 
the Canada Drug Agency and, and CADF. Um, it's, it's largely focusing on things that we've learned were a focus of the government for some time. Uh, and these three uh, commitments, I think you would have seen in different forms uh, and variations over the last couple of years. Next slide, please. So there's a bunch of stuff missing in the budget. Let's tie this all together. So, uh, and Danielle, feel free to jump in here if, if I've missed anything. Um, there's been a lot on nutrition from this government since 2015 in platforms and in mandate letters. Um, there's not much uh, there yet. There's an outstanding commitment for their food strategy. I believe it's around um, uh, um, uh, front of package labeling that hasn't been uh, fully implemented yet. Uh, health data was a really big push of the government a year, uh, uh, this time last year. Um, it seems to have stalled, especially with some of the language that I referred to from Quebec. We do have an interoperability plan, but I don't think Quebec has signed on. It's rather challenging to have an interoperability data plan across provinces when your second largest province isn't participating. Um, so I, I would say that that's a bit of a stalled piece, but I would be happy to be challenged by those uh, in government um, because there might be some work that they're checking way on that is not particularly public facing. Uh, on on rare drugs, uh, we haven't seen a deal yet, but there is lots of work happening um, with the advisory uh, committee that is struck uh, by Health Canada. I know there's some work that has been announced that that CADF and others are doing. So there is some activity there, but there's not that deal with provinces and it was largely left out of the budget. Other things not really in the budget, Health Workforce Canada, which is a, a, a new uh, agency under CAIHAI that's been up and running now. Pandemic preparedness, I, I, was, I, was, I shouldn't be shocked based on every time we have a pandemic that the feeling and priority of public health seems to dip afterwards. But it was a little surprising how light pandemic preparedness was, as well as how light they were on the biomanufacturing life sciences strategy. It was just a mere passing uh, reference to it uh, in the lead up to the innovation section of the budget. Can a drug agency didn't profile in the budget? I'm not surprised there wasn't money in there. That was already announced in, in December, so they didn't need any uh, money from central agencies. That was already taken care of. And then, of course, there was nothing on the diabetes, medical devices, and supply front. So I'm almost done here. I think we have one more slide around key takeaways. Um, it was an expensive reset. So listening to Eden's presentation, this is the government that has been behind in the polls for some time. They, it looks like they've hit their bottom point, though that could change if something changes with the NDP. Um, they were looking to provide a opportunity to contrast themselves with the conservatives. That's where some of that capital gains uh, taxation comes in. You know, are they you on the side of corporations or people? Are you really populist? So it was, it was an expensive uh, reset and it was a big communications exercise to reset. Um, I ha I, I'm not sure it's moving the polls. The, the challenge with the government when it gets older is that it hits the best before date. And at one point, no matter what you do, it's just not going to land well. And I think they're struggling with that a little bit. Um, it's also a challenging budget because so much of the funding is back-ended. Um, you know, we need an election in two budgets from now to see the, uh, see the, the realization of the commitments for health research and, and AI. Um, it, it, it makes it feel a little challenging to see what is in the budget this year um, to, to move the needle on a couple priorities. And as it uh, has been the case with, um, uh, with this government, especially on health, it requires that PT collaboration. They're butting heads on climate change with provinces, but they've been doing that for a while. On health, it doesn't appear that they're looking to um, butt heads. Light on pandemic stuff, post-pandemic preparedness, um, supply chain security and resilience. Um, none of that really fed into the, um, the budget. There was a little bit of money for some emergency preparedness, about 30 million, but it was a, a drop in the bucket. This, this is not gonna trigger an election. Um, we'll just leave it there. At the end, the NDP are, are very clearly going to vote for it, but um, who knows? Something could happen. And then the last point, and this is one is is going to be subject to a podcast coming up. Myself um, and a couple colleague, former colleagues um, and friends, myself, uh, Jane Philpot, former Minister of Health, Dave Clements, who was our DCOMS at the time when we all worked together, and then Moshal Sanye, who was at EDM at Health Canada during the first round of bilateral deals. So us four are going to hop on a pod and have a bit of a debate in terms of what did the bilateral health deals accomplished last time and what do we think about these ones so we'll we'll pick up this question in this debate in a future podcast and probably not going to come out for for a month or two but um it's really varied in terms of how much effort province put provinces put into these action plans related to the the bilateral health agreements some really did do some pretty fantastic new um uh framing of what what it is they want to focus on 
some provinces really did a copy and paste of things that they were already doing, but that's not to judge that what they were already doing is wrong. It's it's just showing that they're they're largely leveraging these dollars for existing plans. I'm going to leave it there. Eden, Danielle, did I uh, miss anything from your perspective? Otherwise, we have about 20 minutes to get into questions. No, I think you covered everything. Thanks, Peter. Cool. Um, so I'm going to... Um, ask some questions around based on what's in the Q&A and Eden, Danielle, if there's some that uh, jump in, jump out to you, um, more than happy to do it. So the one question uh, is around the AI funding and how it's going to flow um, uh, through provincial transfers or Canada Health Infoway or both. Um, so how I understand is that there's a couple different potential funds in there. Um, there is a fund to come up uh, to, to establish a safety organization around AI. So that largely would be funding to go to an organization to set it up and give its capacity. There's about 200 million, Danielle, keep me honest, for um, AI um, sectoral support. So that could be safety or innovations for the healthcare sector and others. And then the vast majority of the funding, it looks like it's going into um, computer sovereignty. Um, so how do we establish the baseline, the foundations of AI um, here in Canada? Um, and that would that that last fund would largely be ISA driven, but they haven't decided this. This is the sort of stuff that would come out of the budget after the the, the authorities have been established. The funding has been established. Um, uh, at that point, the department would figure out how they want these things to flow. I don't know if Danielle, if you have any other thoughts on that one. No, I think that that's good. There is just there is a regional. Um a way that they're going to be sending it regional too, in terms of how they'll be providing the money. But I think you captured the big one. Um, a question about the bilateral health agreements. Uh, which of the bilateral agreements has the greatest potential to do something truly transformational in any sector? Um, uh, I, don't, I, I can't tell if this is asking about any bilateral agreement that the federal government has done or a bilateral agreement that's currently on the table with health. I, I would highlight... Um, the child care agreements is probably being the most successful that this government has done. It's driven an outcome that provinces signed on to, and they've had a tangible um, impact in terms of the amount of money people are paying for child care. That's probably best case scenario um, for a bilateral health deal. Um, the health ones are a little bit more varied because it depends on what initiative the province wants to take. I generally find it's easier for the smaller provinces to be a little bit more innovative. They have a smaller population, but it's interconnected enough that they can do so. Nova Scotia is such a fantastic example for that. Um, they have a robust population, but it's a very connected system. Some of the bigger provinces, they don't really need, they have the financial flexibility that they don't need these bilateral health agreements. They can, they can sit on them, wait on them, and they have their plans. Um, but if I'm answering the question, I, I, would, I would choose childcare as probably one of the better examples of a bilateral health deal that has had some success. Um, the COVID ones as well, too. All of them, you could arguably say, were very, very successful. Eden and uh, Danielle, feel free to jump in if you have some thoughts as well, too. Um, I can just uh, there's one question, Peter, I can answer in terms of the question about 748 for the tri-councils, whether it was the same level of funding as previous or additional funding over and above what they were already getting. So we don't know the comparison. We have to look back into the annual reports as to what they've been getting. But for an example, the largest investment since this one was in 2018. And the numbers for that was it was 925 million over five years. Um, so to compare it, it's about technically double um, overall. But as we sort of mentioned, a lot of that is back ended. So uh, we don't actually know if the, the 748 million is in a, like on top of what they would have received last year. But that's just a comparison of last year. It wasn't even mentioned in the budget. There was no number. Um, and we did some digging on it. And in the last few budgets, it was incredibly difficult to find anything. The, the last budget that actually mentioned a big infusion of money was 2018. And that was the number that they were given. So at first glance, it seems like a lot. Um, but then as you sort of get into the details, it actually is less if you consider all of the money being taken away from CFI too. So I hope that answers that question. Thanks for that, Danielle. There's a couple bilateral health deal questions. I'm going to try and see if I can um, hit them off uh, in a couple different ones. Um, so uh, a couple of them here. Um, there's a question about the not in my backyard legislation being proposed in Alberta. I'm going to pick up on that one because that's a really interesting question. 
Um, there are a couple other questions around bilateral deals. How will the Ottawa ensure the money for bilateral deals is incremental because it seems the provinces are putting it just to things that they were already going to spend on. Um, and then there was another question about will the bilateral agreements be made public? So a couple different things. One, all the bilateral agreements are public online. It's uh, If you just Google shared health priorities, they all come up and you can look at the specific document um, that uh, the federal government signed with provinces. Those documents are really, really helpful, especially when you're trying to understand where the government was going on Pharmacare. They 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 signed a bilateral health deal on, on Pharmacare with PEI, and it was really prescriptive in terms of what they were looking for. Um, so those sorts of documents really let you see how they're thinking and what they're trying to do. Um, I think I mentioned previously that, that the federal government um, doesn't really ever have much success in being prescriptive or providing conditionality to funding. Um, they can convene, they can provide funding, uh, and that might drive priorities. But especially in health, there's two things that are happening. One, the system's already heading in a direction. Uh, the, the, the needs are being driven by the population. So as much as you apply a partisan um, focus on what they think should be priority in the health system, the health system is going to drive its priorities regardless. And I would say that with a change in government that's going to happen inevitably here, um, the, the system priorities are going to continue to be the same. How they might go about doing it, the federal government addressing those, those priorities would be slightly different. You would imagine a, a conservative government really, really did value the Canada health transfer. They might not want to increase it so they don't have to, to spend more money than they have to, but the bilateral health deals are, aren't something that I would see the, the conservatives wanting to replicate over and over. However, they did say that they would sustain the uh, working together, the broad, the broader deals. Um, the the question about Alberta was really interesting, and I want to tie it into this: the non my backyard legislation being proposed in Alberta um, to prevent the federal government from going around provinces to municipalities. I believe this is a specific housing um, one that they're they're really tackling because the federal government came out and said, "Listen, we'll partner partner with any any municipality that aligns with." The things that we want to do uh, and the federal government with a bit of a tinge of we don't trust provinces to get it done um it's a super effective legislative way because municipalities are beasts of the provinces uh it's a super effective way for the uh, the provinces uh to say no 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 you don't you don't get to go around us uh you have to go um to us uh i'll remember <laughs> When we did the the bilateral health deals in 2016 17, I remember how annoyed the provinces got on us, got uh, how annoyed the provinces were with us, because we just started calling um, provincial health stakeholders to talk about how amazing it would be if provinces signed on to this funding, and what they would get out of it, and that really really irked uh, the provinces when we were in uh, negotiation. So generally, uh, provinces will do what they can to to prevent you from going around them, uh, because they're the ones in charge and and they want to drive the agenda. And the reality is it's their jurisdiction, not the federal government's. Danielle or Eden, is there any question that jumped out that you guys want to tackle? Um, I can tackle the one about the Safe Long-Term Care Act and whether we'd be seeing it anytime soon. So there's been no actual public announcement for this date, but we have heard that it should be coming before the summer. So we are anticipating that timeline. Um, it would be more unlikely to be in the fall. So I think in the next few months, we'd hopefully see something about the Safe Long-Term Care Act. If that's helpful, but there is no, there has been no specific uh, date mentioned. A um, couple other questions that popped up on Pharmacare, the 1.5 billion over five years to cover diabetes and contraceptives seems to be pocket change instead of serious uh, in, intentions. Thoughts? Um, yeah, it's it's not a lot, uh, but at the same time, uh, if if you look at the cost of 1.5 billion for two different um uh, circumstances, one could only imagine how expensive this could be for the federal government if they expanded that out. So while sure, 1.5 billion is a lot, um, it would really add up the, if the federal government truly wanted to scale this, which is why I think it's unlikely that the federal government will want to scale this. It is it is an incredibly expensive endeavor for the federal government to take on. Um, provinces, I'm sure, would be happy to take the federal government's uh, money for this. Uh, but provinces will take it and retain their authority over it all at the same time as well too. And then I'll um, uh, there was one other. Oh, I'll come back to it because I just blanked on it. But I'll I'll hit off another question here quickly. Any insights to the youth mental health funding in the budget and how it will be transferred? Um, if this is referring to the, I'll have to check to see if 
if I'm, I'm understanding the exact fund that you're speaking about, but if it's the youth mental health funding that's part of the mental health bilateral deals, that would be to provinces to disperse as they like. But Danielle's nodding their head, so it might be something else here. No, it's different. So it's added into this budget, the $500 million. It, There's no um, description in the budget as to how it would be transferred. It said it would be open to organizations, though, to provide for them. So I think... It could be something like a grant or something that you would have to apply to, um, but we don't know the specifics around that yet. Uh, there's a few more, Peter, here. Um, operators, there's a question about operators planning to build new or replacement long-term care homes in Ontario. We're hoping to see language for the GST forgiveness. So this was included um, in previous funding in 2023, and it's actually currently in regulations right now. The regulations have not been publicized but we know that essentially what we've been told is that um, long-term care is not exclusively ruled out. And as long as they um, comply to the regulation, whatever they've included in there, they should have access to the funding, but they are working on those regulation drafts right now. So we'll, we should learn more. So long-term care is not excluded from it. Um, as long as they sort of follow, you, follow whatever stipulations will be in the regulations, but it would this was not mentioned in this budget. And then another one, Peter, I think we can address is our interpretation of the reaction from the other parties as well as other critics. And we were kind of talking about this at Santa's this morning. Um, it says it knows that it's obvious that the other parties will challenge it, but do you believe there was more criticism than usual? And I think that this sort of goes back to what Eden was talking about with the polls and um, just the fact that this government has been in power for so long. It, the other opposition, you know, the conservatives and the other parties, they see the polls that we are all looking at too. I think everyone sort of appreciates the political landscape that they're in. So it might feel like there's more sort of vitriol right now uh, against this government, but they've just, they've been in power for a really long time. So it's going to be a challenge for them to come out with anything really new or something that's not going to be criticized by Canadians who are just sort of looking for a change and are just unhappy. Um, so I don't know if Eden or Peter, you want to add to that, but I think that um, that kind of addresses why it, it feels like there's so much criticism. It's just that uh, Canadians are pretty much ready for a change and it's hard pressed for the Liberals to sort of get a win at this point. Thanks for that, Danielle. There's a couple other questions we can hit off. Um, uh, we're really trying to get through them all, and we have another five or so minutes, so we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, there's a question around why provinces uh, have not signed up for the money for rare diseases. What a fun question to ask. Um, there's there's a couple challenges for provinces on this. Uh, $500 million a year, the $1.5 billion, it's, it's a lot of money for administrative issues It's uh, or foundational um, uh, data uh, collection um, opportunities. It's a drop in the bucket in terms of actually paying for drugs for rare diseases. And I think I think it exposes a challenge for the file overall because the the file started out as a strategy for high cost drugs. It was changed um, to focus on uh, a drugs for diseases. I still think the authorities around the fund are around high cost drugs, whether you call it that or not. Um, and it also creates um, a bit of a challenge uh, for provinces and territories because it makes it look like there's a lot of money when there probably isn't. And the provinces will want long-term sustainable funding so that they're not just doing a project or two, they're actually looking to address something over a long period of time. And the fundamental challenge that provinces face here is those increased costs. So, so regardless of what initiatives we do around this, um, the PCPA will still struggle with, with figuring out how to appropriately negotiate through these high cost drugs, especially if we're in a circumstance that Government saying, great, we're going to move faster. We might need less data because we want accelerated access. Well, something will have to give. So I think I think there's a couple different reasons why this has likely stalled, whether or not they're good or bad reasons. I'm just telling you the reasons that I think. Um, uh, it's, it's likely a little bit of um, um, federal, provincial, historical um, uh, arguing over how much funny and how, how long it's for. It's probably one of the bigger ones. Uh, it's probably a little bit of, well, how are we going to fundamentally solve the challenge that we have in terms of um, uh, negotiating and, and listing uh, these drugs when they increasingly for provincial budgets are the higher um, higher growth item on their drug plan. Uh, so for those reasons, it's it's a tough file. But the reason why we're focusing on it, we government is focusing on it, 
is because there's a need to, and it's not going to go away. And governments need to come up with different strategies on how they're going to approach this. And they need to figure out how to get an understanding of what is actually needed in the Canadian population. Our data is, is, uh, is pretty atrocious on that front. Um, there's one question here to Peter about comments on the proposed national caregiver strategy. So this is becoming more of a priority for the government, in particular for Minister O'Regan's uh, under his ministry. They're very interested in the care economy. So for paid and unpaid caregiving, and this is starting to be something that we're seeing more funding behind, more conversations. Um, they're interested in this in terms of the um, care workers and long-term care as well. So I don't know if we have any, um, you know, just sort of comments beyond that, but it is a priority that's becoming something more for the government that perhaps was not there before and is a bigger conversation. So, uh, and that's being driven a lot by um, Minister Reagan's office, the Ministry of Labor and Seniors. That's just a little comment there. I don't know if you have more to add. Um, a couple other things. Uh, somebody asked about Kai High reporting on progress towards the shared health priorities. When will it happen and what will happen if targets aren't met? Um, one, no, nothing will happen to provinces if targets aren't met. That's that's the process of just putting out transparency. And provinces don't generally like signing up onto a lot of these new mechanisms. Nobody wants to be in last place. So the incentive to do better is to not be listed as the province that has, has the worst um, uh, outcomes in that particular measurement period. There's a lot of challenges with the data. It's based on what information Kaihai can collect. Provinces are all in different places. The systems are not the same. So it, it is it is a bit unfair. It's a bit apples and oranges when we're comparing this data, especially when the regional um, makeup of these provinces are wildly different, and the challenges in delivering care are going to be different in downtown Toronto than they are in rural Ontario, let alone rural Saskatchewan. Um, so nothing nothing will happen to provinces if they don't meet the targets. The targets are there to uh, establish a goalpost that we should be working towards. Um, if that's the easiest way to understand that. And then uh, there was another question about, are there going to be considerations for transcription software for physicians? Many have said this, this would help their practices. That would be something that that provincial governments would likely um, need to invest in. Uh, that's that's where the federal government says, we gave you the money. We respect that this is your just jurisdiction. We all agree on these broad priorities, which are pretty much everything in the system. Uh, now go forth and and invest. Uh, so that would be the uh, the intent of all of that. With two um, minutes left, I don't know, you can go for it. Oh, sorry. I was just going to answer the question around the status of the Pharmacare bill. It is right now at second reading in the House, and the House isn't sitting this week, so we won't see any movement on that in the near future. But after it goes through second reading, it'll be passed over to the committee to uh, study. Thanks, Eden. Um, I'll hit off two really quick ones, and I think we're going to wrap up just so everybody can carry on with their day. Somebody asked about uh, rationale for canceling wellness together. I don't know if there is, I think there was a little blurb online about it, but it, the gist of it is it was a COVID program and COVID's now over. I, th I think that's how I'll, I'll summarize the rationale as I, as I understand it. Um, and then maybe why don't we end on this question because it's going to serve as the basis for other discussions we will have uh, in webinars uh, what is known about the health priorities of the Conservatives, assuming the polls are right, and the outcome of the election? Um, the Conservatives generally believe in staying out of the way, giving funding to the provinces to do what they need to do for um, uh, for healthcare. I do think that there will be lots of things that will still continue under under the Conservatives. A lot of work and investments in health research they generally align with. I, I probably think where the government's going on some of this health research reorganization, effectiveness of, of uh, governing councils. I bet the conservatives will want to pick up onto this, but there is there is a lingering question. Why don't I land the lingering question in the last minute, and I'll just hang up and let you guys contemplate it. What is the future of Health Canada? Um, it's a it's a valid question. Um, we have a we have a deputy minister who's uh, there'll be a deputy minister shuffle there in the next next month. Um, if there are going to be some serious reorganizations of the governing council, I don't want to spread rumors because I don't know. We just know what's in the budget. And they they say there's going to be legislative measures and they're going to make big changes to how those governing councils are structured. So if for whatever reason, um, Health Canada no longer has some of those uh, functions, it, it would be it would be a hit to their overall um, uh, budget and, and mandate. Um, and this is after already Indigenous services becoming its own uh, department as well, too, which is big capacity. So there's probably a lingering question of, so what is Health Canada's role in the world that provinces have full jurisdiction 
The federal government flows money through the Canada Health Transfer via the Canada Health Act. And then Health Canada has a strong regulatory uh, role through health products and food branch. There's a good question about what is the future of Health Canada and what is the future of the Canada Health Act? Uh, and I think the the answer will be very different depending on who holds power in Ottawa over the next 10 years. And then the last thing I'd say is that any change on all of this stuff is widely incremental, whether it be Health Canada, whether it be the CDA, nothing happens very quickly in this in this world. It, it's, a, it's a slow transition to evolve. So with that, thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Eden. Thanks for the entire Santa's team for helping put this on and and make us uh, look better than we probably actually would have made this look if we didn't have our Chrome Steam help. Uh, so thank you all, and thanks for joining. Have a good day.